Next up, we're going to talk about fitness, but not that kind of fitness. In evolution, we have a very specific definition. Now, we have two things we're going to talk about. First, we're going to talk about what this is. What is this weird thing that is evolutionary fitness and how we describe it? So first, the definition. Evolutionary fitness refers to an organism's ability to survive and reproduce. You want to get super technical? This means the genetic contribution to the next generation. In simpler terms, this means how many babies did you have? Evolution cares about babies almost as much as Orson Scott Card. But it always helps to make a, to look at some examples to help us understand. Here, we're looking at two birds. One has two children, while the other has four. If we see this same relationship in a second generation, by the grandchildren, one bird only has four grandchildren, but the other has 16. And if this goes on for more generations, this could lead up to a really big difference. In this example, we're not seeing any difference in how these birds look. They look exactly the same. So let's look at another example. Now, these cats, we're seeing difference in their eye color. Maybe this has a, an advantage. Maybe this is an adaptation. Maybe this has nothing to do at all. But you can see, as these generations pass, we're seeing more and more blue-eyed cats. So whether or not that is actually a reproductive advantage, we're going to see more blue-eyed cats in our population. What's interesting about this graphic is it actually gives us a couple different numbers. We're seeing absolute fitness and relative fitness. Absolute fitness is literally the number of children you have, though sometimes that's measured in grandchildren. Relative fitness is we divide everything by the highest number of children. So our blue cat, blue-eyed cats here, they have the most children, so their relative fitness would be one. That is the highest number when we're talking about relative measures. And our green-eyed cats, they have fewer children, so they, we would divide four by nine because nine would be the most number of um, offspring, and we get a relative fitness of about 67%. So these are two ways we can quantify fitness because if we want to be able to model something, we need to be able to put it into numbers. Because fitness is such an important concept, some people like to use this to, uh, as a way to describe evolution. You've probably heard the term before, survival of the fittest. I've had many students tell me that Darwin said this. That would be incorrect. This was said by Herbert Spencer. Also, fine guy, still not Darwin. Here, it is very important to remember that the colloquial usage of the word fitness is very different from the scientific version. When most people talk about fitness, they're like getting stronger, getting healthier, eating better, exercising, lifting weights, like our little sponge here. Let's look at a primate example. Here is a male orangutan. You can tell he's a fully adult male with secondary sexual characteristics because he has these big cheek pads or flanges around his face. However, that's not the only option we see in orangutans. So here are three orangutans. Obviously, this guy is our adult flanged male, but we have one other male here out of these. Can you pick out who he is? So here we have an unflanged male and a female. The female is in the middle. What goes on with orangutans is it's some orangutans are actually still sexually mature, but you can see they look almost exactly like the female. And they are fully able to have children, um, and they're an adult in every other sense, except they don't have the development of these secondary sexual characteristics. Both are completely valid and successful evolutionary strategies. In this case, you don't have to be the biggest and baddest to still be able to have children. Evolution is much more convoluted than that. Really, evolutionary fitness is really just measured by the number of children or grandchildren you have, and it doesn't care how you get them. So really, instead of describing evolution as survival of the fittest, a better term is reproduction of the good enough. Because if we're talking about survival of the fittest, well, Fittest means, has a different definition than most people mean, and if, it can get a little bit circular. The reasons I personally like reproduction of the good enough is it 
uh, encompasses the idea that evolution is very random. We haven't talked about it yet, but evolution doesn't have a direction and a lot of weird things do happen. And strong enough is a better measure than strongest. There's a lot that gets through that's kind of weird, doesn't work too well. Think about that anxiety disorder you probably have. You still got here. So now that we've talked about evolutionary fitness, can you describe it in your own words? 